In the 1960s, Pontiac was well known for producing sporty vehicles, everything from the GTO to the 2 Plus 2 to the Firebird, and even sleeper vehicles that weren't named but had high performance 421s, 428s, and 455 cubic inch Pontiac V8s. In fact, 1968 was Pontiac's best sales year ever to that point. So it begs the question of why in the world would Pontiac change from a formula that was so successful for them all throughout the 1960s in a philosophy that had really reinvigorated the brand from what was known as kind of the old people's car in the mid-1950s to what it became by the late 1960s. Well, the answer was not management incompetence, as some would like to think, on behalf of Pontiac's management, but rather knowledge that the sporty theme was effectively going to have to go away in short order for a number of reasons. The first was that insurance companies were catching on that these sporty vehicles were crashing far more often and had more issues and required higher insurance premiums versus normal vehicles. Up until that point, if you insured a car, there really wasn't much differentiation between the average vehicle and a sporty vehicle. But as the 1960s wore on, insurance companies became increasingly smart about what their data science was telling them and they felt that it was necessary to charge owners of sporty vehicles more, and in some cases far more, than what it would cost the average consumer to procure insurance. The second reason was that Pontiac Management knew that the performance angle was going to be pretty limited in the future for a big reason, and that was emissions. Remember, this was the late 1960s, and as the late 1960s transitioned into the 1970s, emission standards became an increasingly prevalent concern that automakers had to deal with. And with addressing these emissions, unfortunately, came lowering of horsepower and torque. And Pontiac Divisional Management simply knew that there was going to be a material squeeze on horsepower going forward because engines were going to have to meet much more stringent emission standards. Now, this didn't stop them, for instance, from introducing the Super Duty 455 cubic inch V8, which made 300 plus horsepower when it was introduced, but it actually was scheduled to make even more horsepower than that prior to all these emissions standards being implemented. Nonetheless, Pontiac Management, as I said, knew that emission standards were going to be something that was going to prove challenging for the division. And hence, they knew that the power was really going to go away from their engines. And so they had to find a different angle to really captivate consumers. Another issue that Pontiac Management was seeing was that the average age of its buyers was starting to creep up again. In particular, as individuals who identified with the brand and bought Pontiacs in the early 1960s frankly loved their cars and were returning. And of course, by the time the 60s became the 70s, these individuals were getting older and they had families with children and perhaps they wanted something a little bit different than what they wanted when they were 10 years younger. Pontiac was attracting some new clients, but they really were getting a lot of repeat customers. And as is the case with a lot of cars and divisions in the auto industry, most of the customer base is really repeat customers. Pontiac was able to pull off a tremendous feat in the late 1950s, early 1960s, by switching its customer base from elder individuals, shall we say, to younger individuals. But now those younger individuals were becoming increasingly elder, if you will, and the division thought that they might want something a little bit different as they progressed. The result of all this is that Pontiac really stepped away from the performance aspect of its lineup and into a more luxurious orientation and positioning for the brand. This was begun really in the 1970 model year with this new front end, which for those who've watched the channel know that I maligned the front end of the 1970 Pontiacs. I am not particularly fond of it, but I've talked to designers who worked on it, and what they've related to me is that divisional management as well as GM design management wanted this 1970 Pontiac and subsequent Pontiacs to look, quote unquote, like Duesenberg's. So they wanted them to really look like upscale, classic, romantic vehicles. And you can clearly see that in the front end of this 1970 Pontiac. It looks very different from, let's say, a 1965, 66, 67, or even 68 Pontiac before it. 
And that was the thought process, was that they were going to push Pontiac more toward luxury, so it had to look like vintage luxury at that point. And what better vehicle to copy than Duesenberg that had tons of success and was really well known at that point, although certainly even at that point, the prices for Duesenberg's, classic Duesenberg's, were really out of reach for the average customer. So that's where this 1970 Pontiac styling came in, and that 1970 Pontiac styling evolved into 1971 with the even larger Schnoz vehicles. Put in a comment if you like the 71 or the 70 Pontiac better. I think that's really a Sophie's choice, to use the term from a movie of the early 80s. But the 71 had this big Schnoz and kind of took that Duesenberg theme to another level. It certainly was very prominent. And of course, in 1971, Pontiac introduced its first ever Granville, where the name was a mix of Grand Prix as well as Bonneville. So it was kind of supposed to be this, well, I guess sporty, if you will, upmarket luxury car, but it was upmarket and shared the Olds 98 Buick Electra roof, that kind of formal roof line, big, huge car that was supposed to help push Pontiac more upmarket to compete with those upper end Olds 98s as well as the Electras. And it was somewhat effective. The Granville started in 1971. It didn't last for too many years before it was sunset and replaced by the Bonneville Brome. And this big front end would continue on Pontiacs for a number of years. In 1972, it was revised, but the theme was quite similar. Although, let's take a look at an original sketch from, I'll say, an unknown artist. I actually know who sketched this work, but I'm not going to put an individual's name out there because not sure that eh, he's overly proud of uh, this work, shall we say. But take a look at the production 1972 Granville, and then take a look at this sketch the 1972 Granville. I think the sketch is more dynamic and has better shadows, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can really see that the production version does take after the sketch, in fact. Aside from the bumper, which crosses the grill on the production version because of the bumper standards that were coming into place at the time. And I think the 72 is not a bad-looking vehicle. I think it looks a little bit better than the 71. Then, of course, you have the 73 Granville and the 73 full-size Pontiac front end with this enormous five-mile-an-hour bumper that bisects the grill. And I think it's probably GM's worst five-mile-an-hour bumper execution that they did of all of them. It's unfortunate because it's a very authoritative front end, and I think the car looks good overall, but it is what it is. And along the way, Pontiac introduced other models to really complete this luxury theme, including the Luxury Le Mans, something that you never would have thought that Pontiac would introduce, a Le Mans with skirts as well as wire wheel covers in 1972 and an up-level interior. Pontiac did also upgrade the interior in its Granville for the 1973 model year to this diamond button-tufted design and horrible, horrible faux wood grain but it still was an upgrade over the 71 and 72 models to, again, reemphasize that luxury tone that they were trying to take. Now, this actually ended up working for Pontiac, and by the time 1978 rolled around, 1978 was actually Pontiac's best sales year ever, where they sold almost 900,000 vehicles. So you don't think of 1978 as really one of those years where, oh my gosh, Pontiac must have had great sales, but... Of course, you have the Smokey and the Bandit, Firebird, and that was driving traffic into showrooms. And you had the newer downsized full-size vehicles as well that looked quite attractive. And you also had some revised mid-size vehicles like the Grand Prix as an example, which I don't think the 78 is my favorite compared to the 77, but... It was new for 1978, and overall, the division sold a lot of vehicles in 1978. It was a feat that would never be repeated, in fact. The 1978 sales of almost 900,000 units, Pontiac would never touch that again. So arguably, this transition to luxury worked, and you could see it in the styling of the vehicles. But what do you think? Do you think that this was the right move or that it was successful, and which of the Pontiacs from this generation are your favorite? Let me know and put a comment in the comment section. Thanks again for watching.